Yeah, okay. So um, I'll just share my screen and uh, just to give, oh, hang on, just to give everyone the heads up, what I've prepared today probably will be about half an hour to, like probably around half an hour or so, half an hour to 45 minutes, just because I wanted to keep it a little bit shorter because uh, something like Think and Grow Rich, um, I personally, I don't know what everyone else is like, but whenever I'm learning a new topic or uh, especially around wealth and, and finances, I prefer to keep things to the point and simple and then uh, from there have like a couple action steps to take out of it and then um, go out and action it and then um, learn the next thing rather than just being poured a bunch of stuff on me. I prefer kind of getting step-by-step -step learning and just an overview of everything and then uh, learning like, from there. So I've kept it a little bit shorter today. Today's session is going to be a little bit more of an overview. So Think and Grow Rich, there's obviously a lot that goes into the book. Um, today is more just going to be a overview of the of the book. The next few weeks that I've got planned, I haven't actually put out the content yet or the actual plan that I'm going to be teaching on the next few weeks. But um, I'm aiming to for the first one, just to give you a bit of an overview of the book, like what actually you learn from it, if you're going to go out and read it, if you haven't already. And then the next two or three weeks, depending how long this series goes for, I want to dive into a few of the principles and the few the few learnings more in depth in the next few weeks. So I can be more focused on that. But today's more just going to be an overview to get you um, introduced to the concept of a few things the book teaches and a few things that you can actually take out of it. So I'll just share my screen. Like I said, this will probably go for about half an hour, I reckon. Um, that way it gives a bit of time to um, ask questions, share your comments and thoughts, and obviously come up with a bit of a plan for yourself, what you actually want to take out of the book and what you want to uh, do from here. So Think and Grow Rich, uh, just out of interest, because there's a, about five or six people on here who has actually read this book just so I know and who hasn't. So then um, because whether you've read it or not, I still think this will be an overall good summary, just kind of re revisiting things and um, refreshing on the on the topic. Yeah, do you have Grace? I know a few people have, like I think um, Warren obviously has William Christine quite a long time ago. So yeah, Mako, yes. So yeah, even if you have read the book, it it probably I still think this will give a good re refresher. I know whenever I'm learning something and I learned something a while ago, it's always still good to come back to the topic because coming back to it, you always pick up new things. I'm sure you guys would agree. So like I said, this is part one. This will probably be a two or three part series, I'm guessing. So about two or three more weeks of this. And today is more going to be a bit of an overview to the book itself. And then the next few weeks, I'll be diving into um, certain parts of it, which I think are important. And also depending on the feedback that I get from everyone here. So it'll be important to hear what you guys think and what you're interested to especially dive into. I know, I know we always start with the prayer of Yeshua. So before I actually get into the book, does anyone want to read this out? Just anyone who wants to volunteer. Um, just before we actually get into the book to obviously set the space and come into that, because I know this is a, a tradition, I guess you can call it. So Warren, um, anyone here listening in want to volunteer to read the prayer of Yeshua? Why not? All right. Oh, thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms of sound, light, and vibration. Your light is experienced in my utmost holiest. Your heavenly domain abides in thee. Your will is manifest in the earth and all that vibrates on an earth that is material and dense. Thank you for your wisdom, understanding, assistance to manifest our daily needs. Dissolve the fetters of fault that bind us in the same way we release the guilt of others. Lead us not in the temptation or being caught up in superficial things, materialism, and instead allow us to be liberated from everything that keeps us away from our true purpose. From you comes the all working well, the lively strength to act, the song that beautifies all and renews itself from age to age. Amen. Sealed in faith, trust and truth. And I confirm it with my entire being. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
So I thought that'd be good to open the space. And now that we've done that, um, we're all in a good headspace. We'll carry on with what I have for today. So once again, just as a reminder, today is more just going to be a bit of an overview to everything. And it's going to go for about half an hour, just so there's not a bunch of information that you've got to chew on. And there's not, yeah, it's not overwhelming. I prefer to keep it simple and kind of give you a bit more of a broader idea because uh, the book talks about 13 important principles when it comes to growing wealth. It's not just growing wealth, but if you have any other dreams, like if money is not your main ambition, even if you're more spiritually inclined and your, your main vision for yourself is to become one of the greatest spiritual healers or anything like that and not necessarily financially successful. I think we all have that ambition to be financially successful to a degree, but even if it's not that entirely, these principles still apply to that. So really, although I say it's 13 principles to grow wealth, really um, it's more principles to actually achieve success in your life in whatever form that means to you. So this will be an overview to what the book explores, uh, the 13 principles. In the next few weeks, we'll, I'm aiming to make it a little bit more practical and diving more into depth in certain topics of it, whereas today is more just going to be introducing you to the concept. So it's basically like a game of Jenga. When you look at these 13 principles, which I'm going to be going through shortly, it basically is like a game of Jenga. So um, plus I'll, I'll throw in there as well that the emotions can can be there. So if you've ever played a game of Jenga, you know that when you the whole tower drops, uh, if you're anything like William or, or Warren, I've, uh, the, anything like them in any type of game, as soon as the tower falls, you get highly emotional, but ultimately it's about having fun, right? Um, Jenga is about having fun and really the purpose of Jenga is to stack blocks on top of each other and um, however high you can get. Actually, just remembering the rules of Jenga is probably not as much like Jenga as I thought initially, but basically these 13 principles I'm going to be sharing today is basically like stacking blocks on top of each other because um, you may be able to master one or two of these principles, but if you don't have all of the 13 mastered and kind of developed on top of each other, they're all like building blocks and they all kind of feed off each other to help you achieve success in your life. Um, and I'll share a little bit more of that as I go along, but you'll see what I mean. Like all of these different principles co correlate with each other. And the more you can actually synergize um, all of the principles between each other, it'll be a lot more likely that you'll achieve success in your life. So the first principle, the very first step of achieving success of thinking and growing rich is having the desire to do it. Now, it's one thing to say you want to become rich. It's one thing to say you want to be successful. And it's one thing to say you have all of these dreams and vision for yourself. But you've got to feel into it and realize, do you actually have that desire to make it happen? Anything that you want to achieve, like um, think of some of the top athletes like LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Um, who are some other ones? Some AFL champions or depending what sport you follow. Just think of any of them. Think of all of the top singers in the world, like Michael Jackson and Billy Joel and those type of guys. And for them to achieve the success and reach the levels they did, where did it all actually start from? Did it start, did they magically just wake up and be in the top stage and like be in the spotlight? Or was it all started from a very simple place of just having that desire to get there? Most of the people who have achieved success, they start just with this burning desire to actually be the best or, or eventually achieve success in their life in some form. You cannot get anywhere unless you have that desire. So anything that you're doing in your life right now um, that you're trying to build success upon, like if you're in a job or if you're starting a new business, if it's not in the place you want it to be right now, if you feel like your life is a little bit um, not at the place you'd want, the thinking very rich really challenges you to um, question that desire. Like, do you actually have a desire to do what you're currently doing? Or is that desire actually somewhere else when you really tune into it? Um, and that's really a good thing for you to ponder on. So one of the quotes you'll notice that what I've, well, how I've structured this presentation is because I said it is going to be more of an overview. So a lot of it is more just snippets from the book, like different quotes I've put in here, um, which really relate to the topic. And then also just a little bit of uh, education as well. And then that's basically how I've structured this PowerPoint. There's going to be a lot of quotes, a lot of text and different things, just very simple for each point. Um, so the quote that I chose for the desire is the starting point of all achievement is desire. 
Keep this constantly in mind. Weak desire brings weak results, just as a small fire makes a small amount of heat. Very simple, very straightforward and self-explanatory reading that quote. But um, if you think back to anything in your life, and I know for those of you that have been following City Awakening for a while, um, and those of you, like out of interest, have any of you guys actually learned about um, about values and just about values in general? I know, Christine, you have with, with Grace, but has everyone else learned about values and determining your values and things like that? Just about, like, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's another word for it, but basically knowing your values. Has anyone actually learned about that before? Because what I mean by that is when it comes to your values, you'll know what things you actually value, or in other words, what things you really actually do desire to do in your life and what things are just fantasies or what is actually not real, like what are not real dreams of yours? Because the easiest way to tell that is if you have a desire to do something, like let's say you desire to build a business, well, your actions are going to show that you do have that desire. Whereas if you tell yourself and you tell others you have this desire to become a millionaire or successful person, by your actions, you're just watching Netflix, you're going to cafes every day, you're just having fun with friends and doing all that sort of things. Well, your desire really shows you're more interested in having fun and enjoying life than actually doing what you say you do. So when it comes to desire, all you need to look at is the actions that follow from it and you'll be able to, to determine what you actually desire. Um, whenever you procrastinate, that just is another way of finding out whether you actually do desire something. But every time that you have a new goal for yourself, every time you have an ambition, the first place that you've got to start if you're starting something new is just actually building that desire and really doing it. So I'm going to keep repeating myself just because it'll really help sink it in. Um, I was always taught that repetition and, and that kind of stuff always kind of solidifies the learning. So you would not have desire if you didn't feel you could achieve it. This was a big one. And I really like that quote, which is why I've put it in here is that if you didn't feel like you could achieve it, even if it's at a very subconscious level, you wouldn't have the desire to do it. Like Kobe Bryant and all these people, they wouldn't have a desire if they didn't feel like they could become great basketball players. And there's a difference between a desire and then a dream. Like you can dream of being a successful person, but if you have this burning desire inside of you to become successful and to grow wealth, then at some level you feel like you actually can achieve it. Uh, I'm sure you guys can agree with that. Is that whenever you do have this burning desire, there's some level that you do that you can achieve it. That's just part of understanding the subconscious mind is that you don't just have emotions and you don't have these feelings unless they're actually real and they can manifest. So your desire is an accurate picture of what you will one day become if you put in the work. And that's a very important thing to remember, guys, is that your desire is an accurate picture of what you will become one day if you put in the work. It's not an accurate picture of what you will become one day. It's an accurate picture of what you will become one day if you put in the work. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. You hear all of these great spiritual teachers and these great people who uh, very love and light and, and things like that teach about manifestation teach about desire law of attraction and these types of topics and they think it'll come easy to them if they just pray and manifest and kind of work on the energies but ultimately it does come down to the action you put in the the energy work and the feelings of desire and the manifestation should just be the foundation you build upon before you go out and action it and put in this put in the work and you'll notice that with these principles is that these principles actually do include real practical steps of what you can do to build upon this desire to make sure it comes into a reality. So um, firmly establish your desire more than anything else and keep building on that desire. So once you know that desire is there, uh, I can't really give examples because everyone sitting on here would have a different dream or a different desire that you're trying to build towards. Um, and you each have a different meaning of what true wealth is to you. So just ponder that, just ponder what your real desire is in your life. And then once you know it's there, just keep building on it. Ways that you can obviously build upon it is just by keep um, feeding it, by keep picturing good thoughts towards it, affirmations, meditation, visualization, and those are the kind of practices you can do to keep building upon that desire. Because the more you build it up, the more you build that desire, then the more likely you'll go out and want to actually do it and put in the work. So if you just kind of feel that desire and just leave it, then you'll probably, it'll just be another passing imagination or fantasy. Whereas if you keep building on it, it'll kind of keep feeding. And that's part of thinking and growing rich. It all starts with the mind and feelings. 
if you don't have desire, you will not be motivated to act and in return won't get wealthy. Like I said, if you don't actually have a true desire, you'll probably not be motivated to act and will more likely than not just procrastinate on it and won't get wealthy. So a very simple example is that if you don't have the desire to clean the house and you probably won't clean your house, um, I'm definitely not guilty of that. I'm a very, um, uh, yeah, I, I always clean and clean my bed and make it. But it's a very simple way of thinking about it. If you actually have desire to clean your house because you don't like a dirty house, you'll find a way to make it happen. If you don't really have a desire to clean your house, then you're probably not going to leave it messy. You're going to leave dishes unwashed and, and whatnot. So it's the same thing. It does, it's just on a smaller level. But when it comes to bigger level things like uh, dreams of growing wealth, the same concept applies. And by the way, guys, if you have any questions or, or comments as I go along, feel free to put them in the chat because I'm not sure if I'm going too fast or, or a good pace or anything like that. So it always helps getting feedback as I go along. So principle two, which is the next follow on from desire is faith. One of the quotes I liked from for the faith aspect of, of this principle. So after you've actually established that desire, your next step to do it, step two, I guess you can consider it is building faith. So a wisely oriented faith gives to all of our thoughts a fabulous power. You will reach the highest peaks pushed by the strength of this new self-confidence. That's what faith creates. Faith creates a new level of self-confidence. It creates strength and it creates a fabulous power. Now, that does sound like a Tony Robbins speech, but ultimately, if you're looking at building on faith, um, it does give you that those emotions. It does give you self-confidence and it does give you strength. But that doesn't mean it'll translate into results. So faith, really, the purpose of building faith is just to get stronger emotions in yourself and building on that desire to really fuel yourself. And then really building up the energy in yourself to be able to action it and have more energy to keep going and keep pushing through it, keep being persistent and keep being resilient to, um, to get the results that you're looking to get in your, whether it's finance, spiritual health or whatever wealth means to you, like I said. So like I said, I want to reiterate that again, a lot of people, a lot of faith teachers, a lot of uh, churches, manifestation teachers, spiritual and whatnot, they kind of teach you that faith is, it will get you anything in life. Like you can just sit there, put your hands together on your bed, pray, and then suddenly you'll have this miracles appear in front of you. I mean, that definitely can happen. Don't get me wrong. Like it has happened before. Miracles obviously do happen. And um, can come when you least expect it but at the same time you've got to put some level of work into it it's like people who try to manifest a partner and then they stay home all day i mean that's yeah that, no one's gonna jump through your window and suddenly claim you as their partner it can definitely happen but the chance of that are uh, very minimal so the next step of desire like i said is faith because when you build faith then you have a stronger level of emotion and that will um, help you action it better so it's like sports i don't know I always like to go back to sports just because for me, it's, uh, I'm really interested in sports and it helps. It's a good analogy for myself, just really um, kind of sinks it in. So just try to think of analogies for yourself, but um, it just really helps me understand is like kind of putting in sports references. But I don't know how many of you guys follow sports, but you'll notice that athletes, whenever so the difference between superstar athletes and stars is superstars can deliver when the pressure's on because they have a strong level of emotion which pushes them over the edge so michael jordan is a classic example of that whenever he felt like his team was down whenever there was only like a minute left to go and they're down two points he feels this strong level of pain and strong level of emotion that he doesn't want to feel if they lose so he knows that emotion so then he gets he kind of fuels himself by feeling the pain feeling the anger and feeling those emotions and that ultimately helps him perform better Athletes perform better when they have that strong level of emotion inside them, whether it's anger, fear, pain, or anything like that. So if you kind of take that concept for yourself and you're looking to achieve good results in your life and perform and achieve high levels of performance, the way you're going to do that, according to Thinking Very Rich, is by really feeling the emotion. And the way that you do that is through faith um, and, and whatnot. You kind of build upon it and you feel that emotion and that will help your performance. So like I said, 
Faith is the next building block from desire to turn your dream into reality, the tangible reality or money. I've put tangible reality there because not everyone I know is interested or has that high level of desire to build large amounts of money. Some of you are more interested in getting great health. Uh, some of you may be more interested in just becoming a very simple spiritual uh, teacher and depending on what your goals are. But faith is the next building block from desire. So desire is one thing, but then building on it is another. By imagining a mental image of yourself already having accomplished your main desire over and over again. So um, if you repeatedly imagine this image of yourself achieving the goal that you want to, eventually you'll create the faith that you need and believe it's possible to do it. Your And this kind of comes back to your subconscious mind is that the more you actually give it that image that and makes it feel real and you feel the emotions if you actually achieved it, you'll eventually convince yourself and you'll convince your subconscious mind that you can do it. And faith is vital to accomplishment. Whereas if you keep telling yourself and you don't have faith that you can do it, your subconscious mind will believe that and it'll direct your actions to, um, to miss shots. So same thing with any sports or any health. People get injured. People can go through issues and, and whatnot if they have a low level of self-confidence in themselves um, compared to people who play with a lot of confidence. You can see the difference between the two. So the more confident you are um, building towards your goals, the more likely you'll achieve success. That Obviously, confidence and faith doesn't guarantee it, but it certainly increases it compared to if you try to do things with low levels of confidence. So the reason for that is because faith is a powerful emotion and the subconscious mind picks up its vibration and translate into a physical equivalent. So we all know uh, anyone who follows City Awakening, you would have heard the quote by Raymond Grace that everything is energy and energy can be transformed. So faith is just one of those, uh, one of those energies, one of the stronger energies I may add, that kind of is a vibration for everything's a vibration, every emotion is a vibration just at a different level. And faith is one of the higher ones. If you keep feeding that to yourself, it will eventually transform into a physical equivalent, whether that means money, like I said, or, or whatever your goals happen to be. Principle three, the next level of building from desire and faith is then auto-suggestion. Auto-suggestion is basically the means to actually build faith and desire this is really just the actual way that you'll do it and that you'll keep fueling it. So auto-suggestion, one of the quotes that I've put in here to um, for you is no thought, whether it is negative or positive, can enter the subconscious mind without the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion. So it doesn't matter whether your thought is negative or positive, the subconscious mind will pick it up. And the way it picks it up is through auto-suggestion, whether it's positive or negative. So Faith is a state of mind which can be, uh, which may be induced or created by affirmation or the repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto suggestion. So, like I said, auto suggestion is basically the practice of actually talking to your subconscious mind and building on that faith. That's what auto suggestion is. So, faith cannot be achieved, and faith is ultimately a state of mind, it's a state of confidence as well which can be created. Um, and I guess you can consider it that you, you can trick your subconscious mind to believe what you want it to believe just by simply repeating things to your mind through auto suggestion. So through repeated suggestion, faith can be built as the subconscious mind put, can put it to work for you. The subconscious mind accepts it as a fact and begins to devise ways of bringing it about. I, I think you guys would probably be familiar with the book Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. But what he teaches, he's a PhD scientist, and he teaches that the subconscious mind doesn't know what's real and what's what's not real. So whatever you tell your subconscious mind is going to believe it, and especially if you keep repeating it, it'll believe it, and then that will determine your actions where you go from there. So basically, faith can be built as a subconscious mind puts it to work for you. And if you keep repeating to yourself that you're um, going to get the results you want, that you are well on the way to getting the results that you're aiming to, then you'll keep building that faith step by step. So after you've established desire, you've actually worked out what your true desire is and what you actually want to start working towards. After you start building the faith, um, the way you will build this faith is through auto-suggestion. And one thing too, which I'll add in there, I'm sure you've you've heard this before, but you've got to... If you're planning to have a desire and turn it into a reality and you're planning to build faith, 
Well, a key part of building faith is obviously having something that you that you deep down at some level know is realistic. Like if you tell yourself you're going to be a millionaire overnight or something like that, I mean, it doesn't matter how much all they suggest you use. It doesn't matter how much meditation you do. It doesn't matter how much faith you try to build. If you don't genuinely believe that in yourself, then it's, it's not going to work, let's be real, unless you suddenly win the lottery overnight. But you all know what I mean. So at some level, you've got to believe it. Faith is ultimately does mean belief. So if you're going to use auto suggestion and you're going to start building on your desire, you've got to believe it at some level. That doesn't mean you can't push yourself to some things that you don't feel are possible, but at some level, you've got to know you can do it um, so you can get there. Otherwise, if you're trying to work for a goal that you don't even think you can achieve, you're probably not going to achieve it. Whereas if you have this strong desire and you have a strong belief you can do it, then you'll be a lot more resilient. You'll be more persistent. You'll have a stronger mindset, which is a very key part of it. And more likely than not, you'll be able to eventually get there. Or if you don't reach the exact goal you want, you'll at least be able to get close to it. So um, basically through auto suggestion, the more you repeat things to yourself and the more you actually build this image in your, in your mind and your soul, and you actually feel the emotions of achieving success, this is where sudden gut feelings come from. It's where you intuition comes from, inspirational guidance. I'm sure you've heard people talk about how as soon as they did some kind of meditation or they did uh, or they wanted to manifest a new thing in their life, they suddenly got this instinct or this intuition to go out and um, may talk to someone. They got this sudden instinct to talk to someone they haven't for 10 years or they got this instinct to call up this thing or go out and um, try something new. Well, a lot of that isn't luck. That's not just luck. It actually comes because they're at some level, at a deep level, they were doing meditation, manifestation. Um, unknowingly, basically, they were doing all this suggestion to their subconscious mind. So ways to access the power of all this suggestion include affirmations, visualization, meditation, and, and um, some of these other practices, which you'll be familiar with. Just depends what you resonate most with. Like if you don't, resonate with meditation like i i know for me i've never really resonated with sitting on my bed and, and chanting hymns and whatnot putting on music and all i've never really resonated with that so meditation is not really how i do it but depends what you what you prefer and what kind of feels right for yourself you may find just simple affirmations like looking at yourself in the mirror and can, like constantly telling yourself that you're going to achieve what you're planning to do and every day you're getting closer to that goal um, you may choose to do it that way, just by simple affirmations. You may choose to do it by setting aside setting aside time every day to um, just sit still and visualize. That's part of meditation, I guess you can consider it. Um, actually knowing when to visualize and putting time aside every day or every two days to picture yourself achieving it and feeling the emotions of achieving it, because then you'll get more inspiration to do it. And then from there, you'll be able to kind of naturally get instincts and be led to do it. Um, and be led on to different practical steps you can go out and do. Principle four is specialized knowledge. So after you work on the first three, the first three really are more kind of, they're quite similar to each other as you'll probably picked up. Desire, faith, and all this suggestion, pretty much saying the same thing, just on different levels. But step four to put that all into kind of more practical sense or, or at least moving more towards a practical sense is then actually getting specialized knowledge. So successful people in all callings never stop acquiring specialized knowledge related to their major purpose, business, or profession. It doesn't matter how good they are or how successful they are in what their desire is. Like um, They always seek out new knowledge. They seek out new ways to learn and get better at their craft. And they're always looking to improve themselves. Even if you think of some of the greatest people like Roger Federer in tennis or LeBron James in basketball, they still have coaches and they still have people keeping them accountable, not because they need it, but because they want to keep developing themselves and they keep want to keep getting better. Everyone who is a successful person is very much growth-minded. So they're always looking for that next level of growth in some form. And the way you do that is by constantly seeking out new knowledge and seeking out new ways of innovation in your area and um, going out and doing it. You don't just suddenly get to your goal and then you're completely satisfied. If you're a growth-minded person, you're always wanting to seek out specialized knowledge. And even if you're starting out, 
this is a good way to develop the mindset of a wealthy person or the mindset of someone successful is just understanding how they do it. So even if you're starting out, you want to kind of get yourself to the point where you are thinking more growth minded. And the way you do that is by constantly seeking out more specialized knowledge, whether it comes in the form of a webinar, whether it comes in the form of a coach, a mentor, um, a book or a video uh, documentary, podcast, anything like that. There's plenty of ways that you can get more educated and get more knowledge uh, into yourself. Um, it just depends, like I said, on what you're looking to do and the best way you learn. So desire, faith, and all those suggestions then needs to be action. So it's, you can't visualize what you want to become or who you want to become um, and keep telling yourself you're going to be this great multimillionaire or successful person or successful investor or this great healthy uh, looking person and then just kind of not do anything about it uh, the next step before you actually go and action it is actually getting knowledge on it because you can have this faith and you can have this unwavering belief that you're going to do it but if you suddenly just jump in the ocean or you just dive straight in without actually knowing what you're doing then you may you i mean you can still achieve success but it's it's more unlikely that you'll achieve it than likely um, if you play the odds. So before you actually go out and do it, and before you actually go out and action it to be, to start achieving your goals, you want to get the knowledge um, and then action. So knowledge comes first and then you action. It's kind of like swimming. Uh, I don't really remember learning swimming much when I was younger when I couldn't swim. Um, but if you, for those of you that have kids or for those of you that kind of um, teach it, that it's basically like the concept of sink or swim. You can still do it. Like once you have this belief and you have this desire to go out and achieve wealth or achieve success, you can go out and try to action it without any prior knowledge onto the area that you're trying to do it. But you're kind of risking a little bit. Whereas if you get a bit of knowledge and then go out and action, it'll be more likely that you'll be able to achieve it. So let's say, for example, um, if we want to simplify this, that you want to lose weight. So let's say that you realize you're fed up being overweight, you don't feel good about yourself and you're just feeling a bit down because you want to get into shape. Well, the desire is there because you've got a desire to lose weight if you feel that like you want to lose it. You've then got faith you can actually do it. So if you tell yourself that you've once been in the position where you've had a healthy body, well, then you'd, at least you know that it's achievable. You know that you can lose weight if you put your mind to it. The more you feed yourself of losing weight and the belief that you have that you can lose weight if you just stay disciplined and committed, then that takes off box number two, which is having faith. You take off box number three when you've got all those suggestions if you keep um, feeding yourself that you can lose weight and you believe in yourself. But then if you just suddenly go to the gym and start lifting weights, start doing cardio and everything else without even knowing what, uh, what program you're doing, you may still lose weight, but you're kind of going in blindly. So you can you can still train without knowing how to train, but it's much more risky if, if you know what I mean. If you've never been to the gym before and you suddenly go there to lose weight without being educated on what the equipment is, without being educated on the different body parts you're actually training and like how they relate to each other, then it'll be less likely that you'll get the result you're wanting to do. Whereas if you actually put time aside to learn about different techniques, different ways to train, um, different styles of training, like um, cardio compared to weightlifting or compared to um, CrossFit and different things like that, you'll be able to, to determine which one is the best for you um, based on the goals you're looking to achieve. And once you've got that knowledge, then you'll be able to put it into an action plan. So rather than just jumping into it and actioning it, you're actioning your desire without having any knowledge. You'll basically want to make sure you put the knowledge first. Um, I've also put there that knowledge is power only if it's followed up with an action plan. Um, I think most of you here would follow Stephen Pettith and Stephen talks about this a lot, is that you can have knowledge, but without an action plan, then it's nothing. So you always want to make sure that if you are getting knowledge and you are educating yourself, that your, that your intention is that you're going to action it. It's no good coming to trainings and it's no good educating yourself if you're not planning to action it. Um, you're basically you're better off watching Netflix if that's your intention. So um, if you do get knowledge and the more knowledge that you give yourself, you've got to make sure it's followed up with an action plan. But that's uh, one of the next principles. So I won't go too much into that now. 
So before you can turn your desire into money or into the goal that you want it to do, you'll require specialized knowledge of the service, merchandise, or profession you intend to offer. So if you're looking to become a business owner, well, you'll need to get educated and you'll need to seek out specialized knowledge from someone who knows it around building a successful business or selling products. You'll need to find that knowledge somewhere. If you're planning to get into shape, you'll need to find knowledge from someone who is in shape and who's been in a similar position to you and work their way to get to where uh, you want to be. So set time aside every day to learn more about your specialty. Every day you want to be finding a new way to learn it, whether it means find, like doing some research into someone you want to learn from, whether it means reading a book. Bill Gates, I'm pretty sure, reads one book every week, and he's obviously one of the most successful people. So if he's reading a book every week, then that tells you he's always like, looking for new knowledge. So always find time every day to learn more about your specialty, even if it's only for five minutes. Principle five after the knowledge is imagination. If you, don't, if you do not see great riches in your imagination, you will never see them in your bank balance. That's a really good principle to understand is that if you don't see great riches in your imagination, and this basically is the same principle as faith, really, when you want to talk about it, but it basically is the same thing as faith. You'll never see them in your bank balance. If you don't believe you can actually achieve wealth and you won't achieve it, no, no one achieves success without the belief they can do it. If you listen to any interview from any successful person, whether it's an investor, whether it's an athlete, a business person, or anyone who, have, who has achieved success, you'll, you'll never hear them say, oh, I didn't think I could do it. And I felt I just kind of got lucky and now I'm here. They don't say that. They say that they always believe they could do it and they put in the work to make sure they got there. Some people are obviously more arrogant and some people are more humble than others, but all of them to some level believe they could do it and they put in the work accordingly. They could visualize themselves there and they could get there. Um, if you're looking to achieve wealth and you don't see yourself being wealthy and you cannot picture yourself having a lot of money in your bank account or in your wallet or gold or whichever form you hold it in, then you probably won't get there. Basically, what imagination is and what makes it different to desire and all of these other principles is your desire is basically um, be giving shape. The desire is basically a shape of your imagination. So imagination and being able to imagine things is the ability to kind of turn your emotion, the desire that you feel into a real image in your mind. So once you can create that image in your mind from the desire you feel, desire is more an emotion, imagination is more creating a, a picture. Uh, that's the easy way to think of it. Imagination is being able to create a picture of the emotion you're feeling through the desire. So be, by being able to create a picture, Basically, like I've been saying, is that you're able to create more belief and more faith, and then you're also being able to picture uh, the next action steps you've got to take. Our imagination is basically the part of your brain that can work out what needs to be done next to turn your desire and faith into a reality. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. So it doesn't matter how unrealistic it feels. If you actually believe you can do it, chances are you probably can. The only limitation is when your imagination and motivation fail to act. Any great leader of business, art, music, and literature become great because they develop the power of self-motivation and imagination, basically. What you want to do is always think constantly of ways you can do things better and more efficiently. To do that, your imagination, your ability to create images, and your ability to think uh, is what's going to help you do things better and more efficiently because you want to be able to be efficient if you're planning to achieve success. Changes are inevitable. So think of changes that are inevitable in your life. Um, whatever you're planning to build in your life, think of things that will be inevitable. Like if you're planning to, I don't know, like become a business owner, you'll know that an inevitable change if you become a business owner may that be that you lose your job. So think of those inevitable changes and think if you can actually make them now obviously don't be less dumb about it if you're if you're planning to be a business owner and you currently have a job with a stable salary the worst thing you can do is quit your job and then have no money if you fail your business so be smart about it but think of changes that are inevitable 
and then can they be made now? If you're planning to lose weight, for example, can you make changes to your diet right now? Because if you're going to lose weight, an, an inevitable change is that you're going to have to like clean up your diet or get more consistent with your eating or get more consistent with training. Rather than delaying it, can it be made now? And constantly question that to yourself with whatever changes are going to happen. That is basically the first step of actioning it, is think about things that you can actually clean out of your life. And rather than delaying on it and waiting till everything's perfect, think about whether you can do it now. Number six is organized planning. Pretty straightforward, but I'll explain it anyway. The first practical step to actually turn all of these desire, faith, and emotions is turning it into a plan. That's the first practical step. So the first step to transform all of the previous building blocks, so going back to the Django analogy, is that now that you've got the first five blocks on top of each other, the next block that you want to add on it to feed off the, the last five, because that those first five are really the foundations of achieving success. Those really are more foundational principles, but the actual practical side of it, the first practical block to actually build on that foundation is organizing a plan. And the way you do this is, um, actually before I do that, but organized planning is one of the most important principles because a person without a plan is like a ship without a map. With no place to go, disaster is very likely. Or like Jim, imagine if you're trying to lose weight and you don't even have a training program and you just sporadically train whatever you feel like. Well, maybe you'll, you may end up with one really massive bicep and then one on your right arm and then a tiny bicep on your left. And uh, it'll look ridiculous, honestly. But um, or, or some people who focus a lot more on their upper body, you probably notice people who have a massive upper body and then chicken legs. So they failed to plan, I guess you can say. So you want to make sure that uh, everything that you do, you actually have a proper plan for. If you're planning to lose weight, you've got to have a program for that. You've got to have a plan for your eating, for your training, your sleep schedule, your um, the amount of steps you get every day and whatnot. Same thing with business. If you're actually planning to succeed in business, you've got to have a plan for that. If you are looking to succeed through investing, you've got to have a plan for that rather than just investing money into a new uh, cryptocurrency and then hoping for the best and hoping it goes to the moon you've got to actually have a plan. So for example, if you're planning to invest, you got to know that if uh, as soon as the uh, investment goes up by a certain percentage, then you're going to withdraw the capital of the investment and then put it into more investments. And then actually have a plan for that, like a plan for withdrawing profits, a plan for reinvesting the month, like more additional profits you make. You've got to have a plan for obviously taxes. And uh, if you're planning to achieve success and planning is very important. So planning from the start, the best way to do that is basically whenever you learn about achieving success, the best way to plan is by first is like building from the end, building with the end in mind and building from the end backwards or building backwards is another way to call it. So picture your end goal and then build backwards from there. Most people try to build a plan towards their goal, but you're actually better off building backwards from your goal. Now, let's say, for example, you're planning to build a business that you can sell and you want to actually build a business where you don't have to work in it and you can sell it eventually. Once you know that's your goal, then you've got to think about what would the business look like if you didn't have to work in it and you could sell it. You'd probably start thinking, well, if I wasn't going to be there, I'd need to have a good manager. I'd need to have good processes and procedures. I'd need to have good automation set up. I'd need to have um, good sales team members who can by and large um, drive the sales for me. And you'd work out what needs to be done to achieve that goal. Once you've written it all down, like once you've established you need good automation, you need good salespeople, you need a good manager, you need good processes and procedures, then lay it out into a step-by-step -step plan of what's most important to get done right first. Um, in the meantime, while you don't have all of that, still do work that you need to do and fill the gaps that you need to do in the meantime, but know that you're building towards um, getting yourself out of that. Uh, hopefully that makes sense, but that's how I've been taught with businesses. Imagine what you want it to look like and then build backwards based on what you need to get there and start putting the pieces in place of what needs to be done by the end. That's all you really need to do with planning. Desire without a plan is just a dream or fantasy, not a real goal. So if you don't actually have a plan put together, um, even if it's in your mind or even if it's just like a pretty a one-page summary goal or plan, um, like a very simple roadmap of where you're planning to be in a certain time period. 
if you don't have that in place, it's just like the reality is it's just a dream of yours and it's a fantasy. It's not a real ambition or real desire. A good quote is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's a really simple quote, but it's really true. So fail to plan. So basically, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Just give me a sec. I'm going to get some water. My throat's getting a little bit dry. And the next step, once you've actually made a plan, once you've committed to a plan and you've got something in front of you, that you, even if it's really simple, so most people tell you that you've got to create a plan, like a 50 document plan or whatever, but a lot of the wealthy people actually make it way more simple than that. They just have a one or two page goal plan and, a, and all they really have is a roadmap with, uh, with target period, time periods. So let's say you've got a paper in front of you and then you've got uh, within three months, you want to have this in place. Within the next, within six months, you want to have this in place. Within nine months, you want to have this. Within 12, this. Within two years, this. And depending how long you go for, just a really simple summary of what you want to have in place. Because once you've got that, you can basically use that as your roadmap. It's like if you're steering a ship or if you're a captain of a ship, you're basically got a blueprint and building towards and going, steering towards that direction. So going back to that business analogy, let's say you want to uh, build a business that you want to sell, then you may say within three months, the most important thing for me to have in place is good processes and good automation. So if that's your first goal, then focus on that because then you'll have uh, you'll be able to put in the things like you may seek out the best automation expert to help you actually do it. Um, if rather than figuring out yourself, you may decide that you need to actually get someone or a mentor who knows about automation and then going and getting the right softwares for it, the right subscriptions and all that, and then implementing that. Uh, and you commit three months to that. Then let's say your next goal is that you then want to get a salesperson because now that you've got good systems to deliver the product or you've got good um, good, yeah, good automation, which doesn't take much time and you're confident that it will give good results to your clients, then the next step may be getting a good salesperson. So before you build your sales team, you may decide that you want to have a good salesperson. So if you decide you want to have a good salesperson, you may then work out what's the next step for me to actually get a good salesperson. Well, I'll need to obviously have a good sales script that they follow. I need to make sure when I bring someone on, they understand my products and they understand what the business is about and they understand how to sell. So then you develop processes or you develop a sales script or you develop um, documents to just explain your company really simply or develop training systems and whatnot. And then once you've got that in place, then you look at hiring an experienced salesperson or someone new but willing to train and all that. Once you've got that in place, you may then decide the next step is to do, um, what else did I say? Get a, get a good manager. It's something like that anyway. But let's say you decide the next step is to get a good manager. Then you'll work out what action steps go into that before you go out and actually hire the manager. So that's all a plan really is. A plan is just a summary of, of goals and timelines and then being able to make decisions from there. Principle seven, and this is probably one of my favorite ones, is actually the ability to make decisions. Once you make the decision, you will find all the people, resources, and ideas you need every time. And this actually, this quote, I don't think is from Napoleon Hill, but this is a good one nonetheless. So once you actually make the decision, you'll find all the people, resources, and ideas you need every time. So once you actually make that decision, things will just naturally come. Obviously, they're not just going to magically appear in your lap, but you're going to have to go out and find it. But if you believe in the idea enough and you make the decision that you're going to go out and achieve it, you'll find the people and uh, we've we've suddenly found that. Now, after you've actually got a plan, the next thing, the next building block on this is actually being decisive and sharp. Once you've laid out that roadmap like I'll, roadmap, like I was just explaining, you want to be decisive. So we've actually experienced this before being indecisive. So I can own up to that being indecisive on certain decisions we've made. And we you notice the results, you'll quickly notice what happens when you're indecisive. Now, let's say you've got a plan, like you've got a five stage roadmap in front of you of what you want to do. And then you keep changing your plan and you keep changing your mind of what you want to get first and second and third. Then not only does it affect you because you keep stopping and starting, but it also affects other people around you, especially if you've got a team. Like 
imagine if you're training at the gym and you're you're working with a personal trainer and you keep changing your mind of what you want to train and what what your health goals are like let's say one week you want to lose weight next week you want to get a little more a bit more um defined in your arms next week you want to get more defined in your legs and the next week you want to do that next week you want to do something else well obviously number one the pt is probably going to fire you as a client but number two you're just going to look ridiculous and keep and get uh probably not get the results you're wanting if you keep changing your mind the easiest way to think about this is those of you that have done archery imagine you're aiming your bow and you've got a moving target around you so rather like the bullseye is right in front of you but then as soon as you shoot the bow or the arrow then the target just suddenly moves somewhere else then and, and you completely miss it um or the or it's basically like a moving target so once you uh, you're probably going to miss like 99 percent of the shots unless you're like me and know how to shoot a bow really well i'm a no i'm just kidding i can't shoot really well but imagine you've got so yeah basically imagine a bullseye in front of you and then it just keeps moving you know you're probably going to miss it whereas if it's standing there right in front of you you're gonna it's gonna be more likely that you'll that you'll hit it so that's all it really is is that once you commit to a plan make sure you stick with it obviously that doesn't mean you can't make any changes at all to your plan but by and large, the foundations and the main agenda of your plan needs to stay the same. You can obviously move pieces and parts and whatnot. It's like minor, you can make minor adjustments, but the main decisions you make, you want to be really decisive and sharp and stick to it. Because that way, if your team believes in the plan and you believe in the plan and you're all building towards that, uh, it'll be more likely that you'll achieve it. Um, so yeah, always make sure you're being decisive. Um, those of you that have worked in jobs as well uh, and have worked or even have worked with business partners or anyone else, I'm sure you would know the joys and the wonders of people who constantly change their mind and can't make a decision. So successful people are very decisive and they're very sharp with their thinking. Um, yeah, number eight, persistence. After you've made a decision, then you want to be persistent. I just realized I've been going way longer than... 30 minutes but hopefully this is going well and giving you the explanation you need but yeah persistence number eight once you've made a decision uh be persistent um if you believe in the plan strongly enough just be persistent at it and keep going keep building willpower and keep building desire and chances are that if you're not achieving the results you want with your plan that you've created for yourself the chances are either you're not really actioning your plan properly or you don't believe in your plan there is generally one of those two things either you're not either you don't believe in your plan or you're not actioning it so if you're actually got a solid plan in front of you by um building it off the back of uh different experts and people who helped you um you want to make sure you action it and keep being persistent michael jordan didn't become the greatest basketball player of all time by um by giving up he was persistent and kept going it's like sports, uh, a lot of rebuilding teams, despite they're not losing a lot, um, the more persistent they can be, eventually if they've got a plan, they'll build towards it. Like, especially rebuilding teams, you've got to have a clear plan that you're building towards and you can make mistakes along the way and you can correct things as you go. But you want to make sure your plan is very clear, you're decisive and you're persistent in building towards that. Um, yeah, and you can't really teach persistence. That just comes naturally. You've just persistence in someone. You just, you you can't teach that. You've just got to have really good mental strength, and you've got to have willpower and and a strong desire. That's why um, you'll notice these are in a good order because if all of this, all of these different eight steps I've gone through are the, off the back of your desire. If the desire is not even there in the first place, you're probably not going to be persistent. That's why you want to focus on one thing at a time and focus on mastering principle one first, then two, three, four, five, and six, and then going from there. Principle nine, power of the mastermind. What you want to do, once you've got all of this stuff together, I've kind of shared a little bit about this, but you want to get yourself a group of people around you to fast track yourself to an end goal. One of the best ways to fast track yourself to your end goal is by getting by surrounding yourself with the right people in other words surrounding yourself with a good mastermind so um whether that means team members like if you're running a business or investment or invest yeah if you're investing 
whether that means surrounding yourself with other good investors or good business people or good team members. If you're in health, whether that means surrounding yourself with good personal trainers or good accountability coaches and uh, educators, that's another thing. Just basically surround yourself with people, even your friend circles, your social circles, surround yourself with people who will get you and help you fast track to your end goal rather than put you back. One of the most important steps to implement your action plan is to ally with a group of people uh, as you may need to help you carry out the plan. These people are known as your mastermind alliance. And a big reason for that is because you guys would know the importance of energies you surround yourself with. Whoever you surround yourself with, you pick up their energy. So obviously the better the energy is, the better you'll be and whatnot. But also because on a more practical sense, rather if you want to move away from an energetic sense, it's because just logically, more brains are always better than one since there's going to be more ideas, discussions, solutions, and everything else. And it's less thinking for you too. Obviously, more brains than one can be an issue if you're choosing to be around dumb people. So if you're, if you're, let's say you're trying to lose weight and you're around fat people every day, then obviously if you're getting health advice from them, then more brains than one is not a good idea because if you're getting brains from people who don't know how to do it, it's not the best idea. But if you're looking to achieve success and you're around successful people, then definitely more brains than one is better because you'll you'll get their ideas, you'll get their opinions on it, their discussion, thoughts, and ways that you can improve it. And you'll be able to go a, a lot faster towards your goal. Uh, a quote I took from Think and Grow Rich here is, or from Henry Ford, I should say, coming together is a beginning. So actually forming uh, a mastermind is just the beginning. It's not the end. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress and working together is success. So once you surround yourself with a good mastermind, working together is what can ultimately achieve success when you actually can genuinely work well together rather than just be together. A lot of teams, can they can be together, but they can't actually leverage each other and they can't work well together. Some of the best performing companies um, credit it because they have a great culture and they have a great environment and a team that can work well together. And that's what you want to build towards. Number 10 is mystery of sex transmutation. This was an interesting one because I think you guys would have heard this before, but especially if you've learned Tantra or learned anything like that, I can't really speak on um, this as much because I there's better people than me at, at teaching on this. But sexual energy is one of the most powerful forces. Uh, pretty much you would know while driven by this desire, when you're driven by sexual energy, um, you develop a lot more emotions. Sex, as we know, sexual energy is one of the most powerful forces, one of the most powerful energies and one of the most strongest feelings that you'll feel. And whenever you're driven by that desire, you're able to develop imagination, <clears throat> courage, willpower, persistence, focus, and creative ability unknowingly. So just by feeling that, you'll unknowingly develop all of these feelings. And what most people do is obviously they have, when they feel highly sexual, they just have a lot of sex. But if you are able to direct that sexual energy into certain places and direct it into business or ach achieving success, you'll have a way higher level of focus, a way higher level of imagination, willpower, focus, and creative ability. Um, you get a lot of creative. And what I mean by creative ability is creative ability just helps you think of new ideas and think of new ways to do things and ultimately action it. And the more you can harness that, sexual energy and direct it into the right places you'll notice a difference and um the think and grow rich book is really big on this actually rather than just channeling your sexual energy into sex you'll notice that you can get incredible results by channeling that into business or into investing because it just uh, increases your focus and increases your imagination um massively number 11 is your subconscious mind so once you have mastered the previous 10 principles, then it's about building on your subconscious mind. So really the subconscious mind, they kind of fades across all of them. The subconscious mind is just the root of all of this stuff combined and what ultimately determines your actions, your beliefs, your faith, desire, and everything else. But the subconscious mind is a place where all memories, beliefs, and programming are stored. Subconscious mind is what creates your faith, what can determine your actions, the subconscious mind, the 
the more you fade at good thoughts and positive images and good emotions, this is where your instincts come from. Whenever you get gut feelings or whenever you get sudden impulses to do things or get led or guided towards uh, certain people or um, things, then that's that comes from the subconscious mind. That's why it's really important to understand your subconscious mind and develop it because the stronger this is and the stronger you can give it the images and the beliefs you want it to have, the more likely you're going to achieve success. Whereas if you constantly tell yourself and um, tell your subconscious mind that you're a loser, you'll never achieve success and you'll never get to where you want to be, then your subconscious mind will believe that and your actions will be determined accordingly to that belief. So that's what you want to look out for. What I'd suggest, rather than me spending a lot of time on this here, is read The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. I mentioned that earlier, but he's a PhD scientist and it's one of the best books you'll ever read on the subconscious mind to really understand it, understand the difference between this and the conscious mind. And you're, the more you can understand this, the better. And that's why I would really suggest you read that book if you haven't already, or even if you have, consider revisiting it. The subconscious mind makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into a reality of thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality of thought driven by courage or faith. That's why uh, you're basic, basically what he's saying is that it doesn't matter whether you're feeling a fearful thought or feeling a positive thought, whichever one it is, the subconscious mind will pick it up Without, it'll believe it's real and then it'll go out and manifest it for you or, or it will lead you to, to do things based on that emotion. That's why as much as possible, you want to be feeding at good things and feeding at good courage or faith. Principle 12 is the brain. The brain is the most pow one of the most powerful forces the world has ever known. The result of sex transmutation is more thoughts, creativity and ideas to the brain. Recognize this and give your brain the job to handle these ideas and turn them into a reality. That's why basically um, this chapter really talks about, this is like the follow-on effect from the sex transmutation, is that the more you can direct your thoughts into the right places, then that energy will go into your brain and then be able to give you more ideas and more thoughts and creativity. That way, recognize that the brain obviously is a really complex subject and it's one of the things that you want to understand. The brain is obviously what drives you to do certain things, to believe certain things as well as your subconscious mind. But as much as possible, you want to feed, <clears throat> feed the right thoughts to your brain, channel the right thoughts to your brain and channel the right energies to your brain because your brain is ultimately the, the vehicle that will put your action steps and your beliefs together to go out and actually do it. Someone without a brain, you can't really think of good ideas and you can't really go out and do things because if you're not smart enough or you're not intelligent enough to go out and do it, then you won't be able to. So as much as possible, work with your brain, work with the energies and use your like really use your brain to actually go out and action the things that you've been building upon. You can really see that it's just like a game of Jenga because... The more you build these blocks on top of each other, it ultimately leads to using your brain and then going out and doing it, just really going out and doing it. The final one, final principle is number 13, which is the sixth sense. Um, I kind of touched on this before, but it's like the subconscious mind that once you've, well, once you've developed all of these other 12 principles, you'll notice a lot of people credit their success to their intuition. I've heard people like Oprah Winfrey, even Bill Gates, Warren Buffett is quite intuitive with his investments and um, can't really think of any names at the moment, but those are some people that come to mind. They credit their success to their intuition and I'm sure, Warren, you'd know some people and different people would know people who have credited their success to their intuition, but the way intuition comes is, is that obviously some people just naturally have it more than others. There's no doubt about that. Some people are just naturally more intuitive than others, but Ultimately, your sixth sense develops once you've actually put all of the other 12 principles in place and then you're able to go out and action it because when you have a desire, when you have faith, you've got a plan, you've got your decisive and your, you've got discipline in all of these different areas, your intuition will naturally follow and you'll be led to do certain things 
you'll be led to certain people and then you'll be able to go out and action it. That's what this talks about is that to develop a good intuition to go out and do it, you've got to have all of these other foundations in place to do it. You can't solely rely on intuition. You definitely can, don't get me wrong. You definitely can solely rely on your intuition to go out and achieve success and wealth in your life. But if you're not able to action it and you're not able to have a desire, then the intuition really won't mean anything. Because if you just get a gut feeling and you don't do anything about it and you don't put it into a plan and you don't have faith in yourself or anything like that, obviously the intuition really doesn't mean much. That's what it talks about in here. And it's also why I'd suggest doing it in the order that it's, it's kind of laid out here for you is that going through the first 13 principles and um, then leading yourself to a really good intuition to go out and action it. That pretty much concludes what I was going to teach. So it um, went longer than I thought, but that's okay. Hopefully you guys got out some good lessons from this and um, took a bit out of it, even if you've read it already. Uh, kind of, this was just from my perspective of, of things. I just kind of took out what um, kind of stood out to me and took out key summary and snippets of what stood out to me. Everyone's different. So whatever you're trying to build towards in your life, you'll probably take different things out than I would. So that's why um, as much as possible, if you read the book yourself, you'll take out different things to what I did and be able to relate it more to you. But even from this presentation, hopefully you were able to take parts that related to you. Um, but yeah, in summary, I don't know why. In summary, what I'll finish off with is that like a game of Jenga, just keep building upon these foundations, keep stacking them on top of each other. And if mistakes are made along the way, that's okay. Just keep going at it. And like um, it can be fun, it can be obviously emotional. Achieving success is definitely a whirlwind journey. You'll never meet any successful person who said, yeah, it was just a breeze to get there. There was a lot of, there's a lot of emotion that goes into it, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, complex complexities. Obviously you can change that if like, just by your belief and all that, but just be open and embrace challenge, embrace it, be persistent, be resilient. And within a matter of time, surrounding yourself with the right people, you'll be able to get there. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, anyone want to share their greatest learnings or share any comments and um, what actions you want to take out of this? Like, obviously, if it's as much as possible, you want to put it into a bit of an action plan. So even if you think of something you can take, I know this was more a bit of an overview session, but still, uh, still good to get some action steps out of it. So anyone want to take the mic or leave a comment, feel free to jump in. So you don't know, they don't jump at once. Edward, thank you so much for that. Um, you can never go um, wrong with having repetition. And uh, for me, it's always my attitude towards um, re relearning and learning is to be childlike and, uh, and not be an adult about it. Because if I'm an adult, I know it all. But being a childlike, you always get something fresh and there's always um, a sense of, you know, wonderful expectation of what you get out of it. So, um, <clears throat> so it was good. Uh, I got a lot, a lot out of that because I came through looking at it or listening to it through fresh, fresh ears. And also it's always good to see other people's perspective. So that was good, Ed. Mm. Yeah, thanks. First stain, start at the end point and plan backwards. Yeah, I think that's a, definitely a good one. Stephen Pettit also talks about that. Um, he kind of reminded me about, he reminds a lot of us about building from the end. So it's one of my favorite ones too. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really good. I, I chuckled when you said about going for half an hour. I thought that'll be a good e effort to do 13 principles in half an hour. And, but yeah, it was really good because 
very, really important principles. And it's important to understand the background to this book. The fact that um, Napoleon Hill um, was approached by Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in the world, and offered to write that book. And what he said to him is, I'm not going to give you any money for expenses, number one. He said, so he basically said, I'll introduce you to all my friends, the 20 richest men in the world. He said, you'll get to, to glean their wisdom. You'll personally sit with them and find out everything they know about money. He said, there's two catches. Number one, I won't give you any money for expenses. And two, you have 60 seconds to decide. And basically, he decided, I think, within 30 seconds. And that was how the book got written. What's very interesting, too, about Napoleon Hill is that he, many consider it one of the greatest books that's ever been written on the subject. Yet, interestingly, he himself died a pauper with no money. Very few people know that. In other words, he didn't always apply what he taught. But yet many have got rich from what he taught. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Did you know that, Ed? I knew the, I, I, I remembered the background to it, but I didn't know he died like a pauper. Yeah, he died with no money. So. Yes, Warren, can I just um, add to that um, part? I, I did actually know that. Um, but what came to mind when you reminded us of that was that obviously money wasn't his highest value. No wasn't his path exactly his path was to educate people it's really Correct. interesting isn't it yeah so it's really important grace talks all the time about values you know and it just shows you how much you need to know your values and apply what ed just spoken it was really good ed i'd really enjoyed it what ed's just spoken about you have to apply that to your highest value i think well you got to think of buckminster fuller as a really good example of that i mean buckminster fuller um he was many consider him one of the greatest um you know experts and one of the greatest um guys who changed the world with wealth and everything and yet buckminster fuller um he deliberately he didn't actually end up with a lot of money himself but that was deliberate he actually decided that he would put all of his money into foundations and help others get rich so he made millions and millions and millions of dollars and gave most of it away and he said he chose to do it he was very happy doing that and my uncle was very similar. My uncle made lots of money, just decided to make sure his wife was set up well, make sure that my aunt um, was there for the house, a good a good retirement fund, and then the rest of it he gave away to help the poor. So. Well, yeah, I think that's why it was a good one, the desire part of it, in my opinion, what he was talking about, because you don't know if you've got that desire, just be honest with yourself. Yeah, correct. Also, what he shows me, you can learn and learn and learn and have so much knowledge, like obviously he did. And um, and having left um, the planet Earth as he was, um, you can have so much knowledge. But to me, it's actioning, isn't it? It's the action, the planning, the strategy to yeah. really get going. And so he had the principles. He had the knowledge. Um, I wonder if he did it himself. Yeah. Doesn't sound like it, but maybe that's because his path was in education. Yeah. So I was, our mantra is always that if we teach people whatever we're teaching, then we have to apply in our own lives. So we have to do it ourselves. Um, oh. Otherwise, there's no really, there's no much power in it. I mean, sure, Napole Napoleon Hill has impacted a lot of generations, uh, but um when you look at it it's like well <clears throat> how much impact would he have created if he did it himself if he left a um not just the the mindset and the words but actually materializing it leaving a legacy of a building of whatever i think everyone's going to choose their path don't they grace it's interesting because um I, I agree with you, but what's interesting is I, I was saying this to Ed the other day. I said, let's just give a hypothetical scenario that that really summarizes everything about this, especially when Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes that whether you're a rich man, a poor man, or whatever, you all die the same way. And really nothing, nothing, you, you're basically the one energy, you're both God. And this is something that the shamans in the Amazon, when someone asked this lady, how do you turn into a a bird like how did you manage to because she did she turned into a bird in front of him started flying 
He, and he said, because I know that the bird and I are one and the same, and I'm no different to a bird and no better than a bird. So a rich man and a poor man is no different. And I'll give you a really good example. It's quite funny, but true. So imagine that someone comes to you, okay? Let's just say someone comes to me and comes to Ed and independently, and he says, I want to give you a million dollars. And there's only one thing you've got to do. And what's that? And then basically... He shows me, say, his daughter, who's one of the ugliest girls he's ever seen, and says, you've got to sleep with her and spend a night with her and two nights with her. And I'm going to give you a million dollars if you do it. And I say, yeah, no worries. Um, I'll do it. Yeah, no, no drama. So I go, okay, I'll do it, and I'll push myself through it. I mean, Ed says, no, I'm a noble man. I will never, ever do this for money, and I will, do, I will stay an honourable man no matter what. The truth is, which one's got the better story? The answer is both of us are funny because let's just say we're both sharing it and Edward's sharing his story like, nah, and everyone's going, yeah, nah, it's so good you went by your principles. Then I go up and go, yeah, I did it. Did you enjoy it? No, but I made a million dollars. Blooming awesome, isn't it? I've just gone out that the time of my life. Everyone would crack up laughing going, that's, that's classic. Which one had the better story? The answer is we both really, our story was just as funny as each other. Both was just as noble as each other, but we just come from a different side of the same coin. So I said, when you really think about it, it's like, that's why it does come down to your choices and what you want to do and enjoying life. So, you know, so if riches are important to you, you should do it a hundred percent. You shouldn't go, mm, should I do it? Mm, I feel bad about it. You know, say, no, just go all out. Let's just make large amount of money and be the best of it or equally go, nah, like Napoleon Hill or Buckminster Fuller, let's just enjoy it. And really, when you, when you think about it, it's one and the same, isn't it? Mm, it certainly is. It just was a realization I had yesterday, really big realization that just hit me. I'm like, you know, because I spent so much of my life trying to be this good Christian noble man, you know? And I did, as you know, and you know that better than anyone, Grace. And I look back now and chuckle, and then you meet the person who's the exact opposite. Like I still remember about 30 odd years ago when I was a really strong fundamentalist Christian and all that. And, I, and, I, and one of my friends from church, his sister came over from England and I ended up spending the day with her. We just caught up and went out and we got on quite well. And she lived this very party animal life. And she basically said to me one day, I said, your I said to her, your family must beat you a little bit out there. She says, oh yeah, no. Nah. She said, my, fa my family told me, you know, that I'm a sinner and I'm going to go to hell. I go, okay. And she goes, I'm cool with that. And I looked at her and I laughed. She goes, no, I'm serious. She said, I thought about it and thought, yeah, they're probably right. You know, if I'm living my life and there's a heaven and hell, I'm probably going there. Am I okay with it? Yeah, it's fine. And she was so calm about it. I just looked at her and go, oh. And I remember just sitting there cracked up laughing. And she said, yeah. She said, she said I'm not going to sit here not enjoying my life and doing what I want to do. I'll just go to hell. That's fine. If I'm going to be tortured and fire, so be it. Hopefully that's not true, but I think it probably is. And I remember the way she just accepted her reality was, was so profound. I thought, she's probably actually going to be okay. And I walked away thinking, she's probably end up going to actually end up being okay. But, and knowing what I know now, I'm sure she actually is. So there you go. Well, I think that's good. Too. I think it's like a lot of people who have this, like these deep desires, but don't do it and they just hold it in. Those are the, probably the, the hardest people. Oh, well, yeah. I think it's like someone said to me the other day, would you do porn? I said, oh, if I got enough money, I'd probably do it. And they cracked up. I said, yeah, I'd do it. I'd probably wear a mask or something. But yeah, if someone offered me a large amount of money, I'd probably do it. <laughs> yeah, well, good thing you've got the poll to kind of do the intro, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so at the moment, I've got no desire to do porn. But if someone said, I'm going to give you 10 million to do it, I'd probably go, yeah, okay. Oh, there's no way I'd say none of that. Uh... It's always a price for everything, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Right, yeah, that's that's your way of if that's your way of thinking and growing rich, no one here is gonna stop you. Well, no one's offered me that money yet. Eh? That's the problem. <laughs> someone I don't know if you will, but I mean hopefully someone who listens to this will, but yeah, no one has yet. So right. I'm destined to kind of keep being a spiritual teacher and possibly a part time pole dancing stripper, who knows? Well, if thinking growing rich means you become a porn star, that that's one <laughs> way you can do it. Oh. This is the thing. I'm at this point in my life. I'm like, whatever. I'm just want to enjoy life and speak and help as many people as we can in what we do and live the most fun, ridiculous life I can imagine and see where it takes me. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you um finish off on I've got this slide, um, this slide here from your other ones. Yep, okay. Well, if you want to give us all your money, that's what you that's the that's the um account details. Um and I like what Bruce said, you know, he's this um entertainer who speaks in the mall, and what he says to everyone is now is the time I'm gonna ask you to give me all your money. And then he goes, Oh, you all went quiet now. And then he goes to people. Okay, he says, well, he goes, if you enjoyed the show, please give some money. And if you didn't, please give some money anyway, because it's not it's not good that both of us should walk away disappointed. So I'll just say the same thing today. Give us all your money as a church. We're your gurus now. And if you didn't like the message and thought Edward was shit, just give us all your money anyway, and at least he's on a walkway happy. Uh... <laughs> it was worth a try anyway. If you want to put some funds towards new shiny underwear, go, go ahead and... Yeah. I know. So what will the money be used for? It'll be used to fund my pole dancing, my stripping, um, and to fund a completely frivolous, meaningless life. And we would probably also spread the work of City Awakening while we're about it as well. All is vanity. <laughs> uh, well, that pretty much wraps it up from my end. Uh, any yeah. final Thanks, words? Steve. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one, Ed. So... Hey. If it's half an hour today and it's going to be an hour next week, so I better leave myself a couple of hours, eh? <laughs> no, nah, nah, well, I'll keep it. I'll keep it like half an hour to an hour. Well. <laughs> but seriously, Ron, this is if you like the new direction of City Awakening, because the idea is to start doing really practical topics like Neville Goddard, like me speaking on that, Edward on that kind of stuff. You know, give us some feedback because we really want to spread the word and try and find a way to really you know help empower people and mixture of both spiritual and practical teaching so if you're enjoying the message please give us feedback if you think what we're doing before was better let us know as well so it'd be really good just to get feedback so thank you everyone i just want to make a comment there warren i think it's really good especially in this time to have practical things because there's so many people just don't know where to go what to do even little steps you know i think that's what's causing a lot of the fear with people who are actually realizing there's a lot of people who are realizing what's going on but don't even understand why or how or what they can do so it's really good i think that you're putting a lot of practical stuff in okay that's great thank you very much it's awesome all right well Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. See you, man.